Okay, everybody. We're going to get uh, re-situated here with our panel discussion. Hopefully you met somebody new or at least had a good and interesting conversation about land justice. Thanks for taking the time. Sorry to interrupt so rudely, but uh, we have to keep our session going. All right. So as I was saying, we do have uh, four incredible organizers, activists, entrepreneurs, and public servants here today who are going to share their ideas about how we can harness land for public good. And uh, first off, to my left, I want to introduce Max Kaji. He's a uh, core member of the Open Climate Action Coalition's Edible Parks Task Force and a, a founding member of the North Oakland Restorative Justice Council and an organizer with Fat Beats Produce, a food justice collective in North Oakland. Uh, it's fair to say he's a veteran of the uh, movement for food sovereignty, both locally and internationally. So, uh, Max, please, uh, please share with us some of your thoughts about land justice and how we can harness it for community benefit in the new economy. How are you all doing? Good. Uh, thank you. I'm really um, honored to sit on this panel. There's some uh, fierce warriors here doing um, work to take the land back. So let's give everyone here a round of applause. Speaking about land, I first wanted to just acknowledge that we are on stolen land for those that are visiting. This is a lonely land. We should really acknowledge that as the starting point of the conversation when we're speaking about land. Um, so I only have five minutes, so I decided to um, speak very briefly about the privatization of um, public lands through the lens of uh, gentrification. Um, so looking up over here on the screen over here is a picture in a driver's plaza in um, North Oakland. It's on the border of North Oakland and South Berkeley. Um, it used to be a vibrant nightclub that burned down. And uh, currently, it's where a lot of the folks that have been pushed out of South Berkeley and North Oakland um, reside. People come from all around, seniors and whatnot, to hang out there most of the day. And um, to the left over here, the woman with the green um, scarf around her head is Auntie Frances. She's a, um, an organizer and a Black Panther that does a free feeding program. And she works in our garden around the street in another public park at Dover Park. Um, she grows vegetables there for her feeding program. And so we've been working with her over the last year um, on this plaza here. And so the work that we're trying to do um, at Fat Beats Produce is work to support other people that are going through land struggles. So this area here um, has been, has had a lot of development in the last uh, five to 10 years. And with that, it's had an increased amount of um, policing. And, um, and as that happens, we have this struggle over the commons. And so uh, in this spot, there's different folks that have different ideas. Um, and one idea that the city uh, of Berkeley is pushing on the city of Oakland is to turn this vibrant cultural hotspot that has a lot of greenery that can be used for growing food. We've been planting fruit trees there with neighbors um, when there's violence in the community. So when there's a shooting and someone passes, we work with the family to plant a fruit tree, um, both at this park and in other areas. So as there's this vibrancy in the community, there's also this idea of when, as new people move in, that there's this sense of blight here. You have um, older, mostly African-American population, and uh, the city doesn't want to deal with some of the issues that come along with um, folks that have been seriously disenfranchised over a long period of time. So the city of Berkeley is working with the city of Oakland to turn it into a dog park. And so we see it's kind of, to, to, to our lenses, it's the privatization of the commons because we have this vibrant community um, that's not asking for a dog park, and, and the city is hoping to um, transfer into dog parks so they don't have to deal with any of the issues that are surround poverty or surround um, cultures that are not familiar to the new folks moving in. So we've been working with her. One of the things is they, they needed a porta potty A lot of people are houseless, and a lot of people um, uh, don't have access to resources, and so we fundraised money to get a porta potty Well, she fundraised money to get a porta potty and neighbors complained, and the porta potty was removed by the city, even though that these poor folks fundraised enough money for this porta potty. So what it gets down to is it's this long struggle um, to understand our private, our public lands. It's something that we need to grow food on, to have safe, healthy um, activities. But all along San Pablo corridor, pocket parks are being closed down and fenced off by the city to displace the poor people that are using these parks. Um, and so that's a huge privatization of public lands um, due to gentrification. So we just see right across the street when you guys are leaving, if you go down where the Greyhound station is, right next to Uptown, which is um, really one of the um, engines of gentrification in Oakland, um, 
there's a plaza right across here from Greyhound where there's this vibrant feeding, a lot of people being there, and they just fenced it off. Rather than dealing with the folks there, they fenced it off and kicked them out. Public Works did that. Further down, next to the Cause of Justice Just Cause, which are housing justice, there's a vibrant park. And instead of working with people there, they're going to be fencing it off and putting in art installations supported by UC Berkeley. And so when we talk about land, we have to understand that just because there's a use of land for putting in urban greening or agriculture, it's who is it going for? Who's benefiting from that use? And so we see it as the privatization of public land for the benefit of a small amount of people, and a lot of that has to do with the conversation around gentrification. Given that we only have five minutes, that's a really heady conversation to have, so I'm not going to go into that. But that's the way our organization looks at our work around land and going into the new economy. Well, I'm really interested to hear from our other panelists here, and I encourage people to look into the work that Gavin is doing, the work that Movement Generation is doing around land, and there's a lot of people through OCAC, the Open Climate Action Coalition, looking at taking both public and private land for growing food for communities that are most affected by the food apartheid that we see in a lot of our communities. And I really want to acknowledge the work that Councilmember Kaplan is doing around these sort of things, because I've never had access to really any council members, and her office is always open around the conversation, is a huge ally of OCAC, the Open Climate Action Coalition, and we're working with her around Edible Parks, which is a program to allow edible landscaping in our public parks here in Oakland. Currently, it's pretty much illegal to plant a fruit tree in a public park without a $3,000 conditional use permit, and we're working around that. And it's a huge issue, because we're not talking about taking a football field or a basketball court and turning it into a vegetable garden with raised beds. We're talking about changing the landscaping around it so that when young people come and they're waiting for their brothers and sisters to play, finish their game, they're sitting under a plum tree. You know, a lot of the trees in our cities are flowering plums, cherries, crab apples, and literally all you have to do is graft it, and then we have an edible city. And people do that in the city of San Francisco, and it's now termed felony vandalism. And so we need to change that. And so that's kind of what we're working on, and I'm really happy. This is not a plug for to vote for her for her mayor a little bit, but I'm just really impressed by the courageousness of her campaign. I mean, of her. So I just wanted to share that. I don't know if my time's up. All right, thank you. I just want to acknowledge Max for also somehow managing to have faculty programs attend all these Open Climate Action Coalition meetings and this, that, and the other while running the North Oakland Farmers Market and all of your other programs. It's incredible and not worth the challenge on, so thanks for everything. Next we have Ronna Lamer Chang. No relation to me, except that she's my wife. And she is a fierce advocate for land justice and serves on the community, sorry, she serves on the board of the Henry George School in San Francisco. They promote this radical idea that natural land is a commonwealth from which all of the community should benefit. She's also co-founder and owner of House Kombucha, a probiotic tea brewery in East Oakland, and an active member of the Baha'i Faith community. So, Ronna, if you would share with us some of the work that the Henry George School is doing and the way that Georgism might be a way of helping to facilitate people's access to land and fund the commons. Okay. Thank you. I think I'll just, before I introduce myself and where I'm coming from, just respond to kind of the framework that Max was describing, where, you know, you have this conflict between people who want a dog park and people who, they have no place else to go. This is where they go. This is where they spend their time. This is where they have their community. And that may be alienating to the people who want a dog park. They don't know how to share that space. But ultimately, we need to learn to share the space. That is the real thing. Rather than having a conflict, this land is mine, this land is not, or this land, you know, is mine or yours. And what the Georgism perspective offers is a way to, well, to encourage building up and going higher. So you could put a building on that park that actually could give lots of resources to people in need. Soup kitchens, schools, things like that, showers. And that could be funded 
and that and that could have market rate funding on top and that could also provide for a park these things are all possible and we all kind of know this intuitively that we shouldn't be fighting over scraps of land like we're human beings we have design we have technology we have creativity we can build and there is there is no reason to be fighting over space we can we, we have ways around this anyways um, how I kind of got in the conversation you know when I, is, I first moved to San Francisco 2005 and the most glaring thing to me when I first set foot in the Bay Area besides the high cost of rent was the high preponderance of poverty and it was gl glaring poverty it's poverty not like even in Thailand where I, I saw poverty this, this was just really really sad and really long-standing chronic poverty and homelessness amidst wealth and um, you know we all see this well we kind of have to get used to it we cope with it however we cope with it and um, I became a Baha'i I found the Baha'i faith and found a real community there where you know all the things the spiritual values we all probably commonly hold that we were all created here by, by one creator and we're all equal we're all been gifted this gift of life and that our creator our God is good give us this beautiful earth and the sun and the, and the trees and everything is perfect we all have this belief in our heart and um, and in finding the Baha'i faith and, and developing community there and having to really spiritually see um, my community members as brothers and sisters and having this um, onus in my heart to, to share the message of Baha'u'llah um, and really live into this. One thing that became very difficult is the fact that a lot of people who had become attracted to the Baha'i faith were in my community, were homeless, were among those kind of homeless. So those people laying on the street with, with glaring sores on their bodies, people who look like grandmothers, um, they were my sisters now. And, and how, how to really cope with that, um, you know, so I was, you know, very religious and really into faith and prayer. And actually, it was a, it was a. This is a Baha'i quote: "The earth is one country, and mankind its citizens." Basically, what Baha'i teaches. But this is actually from James Corinthians. I don't know some somewhere it came upon me about what what good is works? What good is faith without works? If you say to a man who has no clothes on his body, be be warm and fed, pe go in peace, and you don't give him the things he needs for his body. What good is faith? Can it save him? And um, it really struck me, you know, like prayer, devotion. These are all very important. But there was this this question, this economic question that all brings us here together. And and um, I had been I met up with a friend from the faith and learned about the principles of Henry George. And Henry George was an economic thinker. Actually lived in San Francisco. Um, about 100 years ago and about progress and poverty and he also was living that question why he, he noticed that where there is the most concentration of wealth you have the most glaring poverty and what it is is about the theft, <coughs> theft of land um, and so that's here's here's sixth street this is where i used to live in san francisco and there's this whole block that's six and howard this would have been like 60 housing units completely vacant Back in 2008, you know, when there is the economic collapse, yeah. Occupy movement bubbling up, people are, are ready to say, what's wrong with this? We don't have jobs, we don't have housing, yet this lays vacant. And meanwhile, oh, my picture of Westville Mall didn't come up. But what I wanted to juxtapose that apart against in, in the, with a picture, you know, on, on Market Street, it's this market street in downtown San Francisco. There was just strip clubs and empty billiard har halls and just nothingness. And then there's this beautiful mall with Bloomingdale's and it's all this money coming through. Well, actually, that that plot of land is held by the San Francisco School District. So that is actually uh, owned by the district and they lease the land. They have a long lease with Westfield Mall. So all that money, all that commerce, that goes back to the San Francisco School District. Mm -hmm. um, that gives them an incentive to make the most of that land. This is this is income for them. So they're going to go ahead and fill up the top floors. So they're going to put San Francisco State there. They're going to put a movie theater there. They'll put a grocery store downstairs. And they have every incentive to use every to use that land to its, to its utmost. And um, but 
But the people, the billiard halls, the people like this, these landowners, they don't. Because actually, it takes work. It takes a lot of work to make things like that happen. And by not working, I don't know if I'm in a vacant lot thing. This is everybody works for the vacant lot. They still make money. Because the way, and so what Henry George philosophy really is about, which sounds really boring in the end, is about land taxes, property taxes, which we all know what those are. I'll come to a close soon. But the big thing that's different about a land tax versus a property tax is based on the location value. It's based on the ground, the value of the ground, not the buildings on top of it. The way we are taxed today is that we are taxed for building on land. So even though your property assessment, you'll get an assessment from the state saying, you know, your land is worth $50,000 on the ground and your building is worth $50,000. Basically, in the Bay Area, 65% of your land value is at least the ground value. You know, houses actually depreciate with time. Land appreciates with time. But nonetheless, the way the code is written, we are fined. So if we build a second story, we build an addition in the back, we put a movie theater down, you know, on the front floor, you're actually fined for that. So there's an incentive to just hold a vacant lot. Because for a lot of these landholders who have so much land, the power that they wield is worth paying $5,000 in property taxes a year. Because they can sell it for $6 million five years from now. And if we actually, it's just a small tweak of the tax code, but it has huge implications for getting rid of blight. So I know I don't kind of do my time here, but I was showing the Park Ridge Theater is actually another example here in Oakland. This is where we live now, and near here. And I last heard there was $10,000 was the rent that they're asking on this. Plus there's half a million dollars of repairs. So the landowners, they don't want to do a dime in repairs. And they want to ask $10,000 in rent and give you a bad lease, like they gave to the former owners, the former movie operators. They were just so discouraged that they ended up, you know, putting their resource into the El Cerrito Theater instead. And everybody has tried. You know, this goes on to talk about Kernaghan and, you know, how the city officials are trying, but this actually is bigger than a city thing. These are state laws. And there are states in the United States that do have a more fair assessment of property, you know, the building on top versus the ground rents. And they also assess yearly, or at least every other year. In California, since Prop 13, that has deeply eviscerated the state of its funding. And in addition to the Prop 13, there's been other laws that have been passed to make it even harder to change any sort of tax law. So this is the, it's a minor tweak, but it's so deeply embedded in our legal code that it would take a lot of education to turn it around. But you can see that it does work in other, just an example of like Philadelphia versus Detroit. Henry George was actually from Pennsylvania originally, so a lot of these land tax laws are alive there. And people don't really notice it, you know. But they might notice, like, yeah, property taxes are higher in this state than that state. But what you do notice is that when the steel economy moves out, you don't end up with a drained city. You have hard times, but you get it back. And the city manages and owns and controls, or at least the state controls the land that it stewards. So I'll stop with that. Thank you, Ron. Is it also fair to say that in addition to helping to incentivize community development, it also helps to garner significantly more resources for the public commons as well? That's another thing. Right. So maybe we can actually pay our bills and fund some of these social programs we want to see in the state of California. Thank you. Well, next we have Gavin Reyers. He's the co-founder and executive director of Planting Justice. Planting Justice is an Oakland-based organization that builds permaculture gardens, creates jobs for the formerly incarcerated, and advocates strongly through a canvas team for food justice in the city of Oakland. He's also recently co-founded Wild and Radish, LLC, which is an emerging 10-acre urban farm in Eco Village in El Sobrante. So, Gavin, check that mic. See if it's working. Hello? Yes. Okay. Yeah, Gavin, if you could just share some of the work you're doing as it relates to land justice. Great. Thanks so much for the opportunity to be here. Hey, everybody. So, yeah, I mean, land is 
sacred. That's where we're coming from. Um, our relationship to our relationship to land is sacred. Um, it's how we get fed. It's how we get water. The trees that grow on land create rain that gives us water. It's how we create energy. It's how we have our clothes. It's how we have our homes. Who owns and controls and profits from land? Land has been systematically um, taken away from common people. It's happened all over the world. It's happening in this country in so many iterations from um, the policies of the USDA in the 40s and 50s to move small farmers off of the lands and into the cities, into industry, um, and it happens you know, continuously. We need to take back land so that it's actually meeting people's real needs. There are so many people, like Ramla spoke about, like Max spoke about, who lack basic access to food, water, a place to use the bathroom. This is a land justice issue. Um, and we have land all around us. Let's just take a look around. Um, the county of Alameda, the city of Oakland, together hold thousands of acres of land. Land that could be put back to use for our basic needs. Um, we could plant agroecology-inspired, permaculture-inspired orchards on public land across the city so that when the Central Valley continues to turn into a desert and people aren't able to <coughs> actually produce food there, we'll still have something to eat as a city. But more than that, um, well, let me just back up real quick. Planting Justice, we've, we've built 300 gardens across the Bay Area. Um, we've created living wage jobs for 14 formerly incarcerated people directly out of San Quentin State Prison. Many of the gardens we build are publicly accessible. Um, they're at low-income apartment complexes, places of worship, schools, people's homes, um, <coughs> prisons, and juvenile detention facilities. And our main purpose is not only are we trying to get access to land so that we can grow healthy food that's accessible and affordable for people, but how do we do so in a way that uplifts the community with through economic justice? How are we creating careers that are transforming the food system to be more just and, and sustainable? And so that's where we're coming at it from. You know, it's, it's great to have places where people can go and grow some of their food for themselves, but that's not gonna cut it for somebody who doesn't have a job, who's got a family to take care of. But we actually need the business models um, that are going to be successful in creating worker-owned cooperatives that are you know, feeding themselves in the community. And so that's actually where we're going. We're a nonprofit organization. However, we have visions to create, um, to help incubate for-profit worker-owned cooperatives using a techno technology called recirculating aquaponics. So one, you know, there's one strategy of reforesting the you know, hills around the Bay Area through orchards and agroecology, but we also have thousands of empty lots in Oakland. And this is land that is not suitable to stick some mustard greens and kale in the soil because it's been it's toxic, right? It, or it's paved. Um, but recirculating aquaponics is a technology that um, is appropriate for paved land. You actually aren't growing food in soil, you're growing food in water. Water that the fish have pooed and peed in, um, which is actually providing you the, the nutrients and the nitrates for the plants to grow. And while the plants are growing and filtering out that water, the water is then clean enough to return to the fish. So it's a closed loop system where the water goes from fish to vegetables back to fish again. It uses 10% of the water that growing food in the ground in the ground uses. And again, we can do it on paved empty lots or other toxic land in the city. So we've developed a business model that um, is accessible even on just 10,000 square feet. You know, we're talking about a quarter of an acre can grow enough food to create four living wage jobs for people in the community and to produce about 100,000 pounds of food over the course of a year. The food is growing so much faster, it's getting all the water and nutrients it needs all the time, um, so you're actually able to harvest food in half the time. But the whole point is, is that, you know, low-income people don't have access to this land. They don't have access to the capital to start these businesses. Um, and so Planting Justice, how we view ourselves is we recognize our privilege and we can use that privilege um, for social justice. So what we're working to do is to get access to this first recirculating aquaponics farm site, make all the mistakes we need to make, <laughs> figure it out, um, make sure that it's profitable, how many people can, can it um, support, and then, um, you know, really actually support cohorts of formerly incarcerated and other long-term low-income folks to learn the technology and to support them getting access to their own empty lot. This is something that we see can be done in dozens of lots all around the city, and then all of a sudden, you know, four people are employed at each site. Now we've got, you know, maybe 100 people employed that are growing, you know, a, a huge percentage of 
the leafy greens and herbs and vegetables that we consume here in Oakland. And so that's just one strategy of what we're doing. You know, Wild and Radish has gained access to 10 acres of land in El Sobrante where we're doing an agroecology farm and training center. But again, that land is few and far between and it's very hard for people to get access to that much land with a freshwater spring. Like we're very privileged to be able to have that. So how do we actually then turn our attention to putting back into use the empty lots, the paved land, the thousands of parcels that are just going to waste in our city that can actually be creating healthy food and jobs for people. Cool. Very inspiring. Thank you so much again for sharing. Um, and how many people are on your team now? 22 full-time staff. 22 full-time staff. <laughs> Incredible. Thanks for sharing. Um, well, last but not least, uh, now we have uh, Rebecca Kaplan. She is, if you're in Oakland, your citywide council member. And uh, elected in 2008 and re-elected in 2012, uh, she represents all of Oakland. And before joining city council, she served as an elected director on the DC Transit Board. I believe Ian Kim from L. Baker Center was always putting in my ear how we need to be watching Rebecca Kaplan. Uh, <laughs> and she also worked as a civil rights, uh, sorry, housing rights attorney in Oakland prior to that. Now she, if you haven't heard, is uh, running for mayor of Oakland. So Rebecca, please please share with us some of uh, your work for community access to the land and dealing with urban blight and urban ag and other issues that may relate to land justice in your mind. Thank you. Thank you much. How's that acoustics working out? Awesome. Good afternoon. Uh, as you've heard, my name is Rebecca Kaplan and I have the distinct honor to represent the entire city of Oakland and I'm so thrilled to be sharing time uh, on this panel with all of you here today uh, with the people who are part of the reason that 20 years from now we will still be survivable in Oakland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I say that because uh, while, while I certainly, I am an elected official and I will talk more about my work in that regard, uh, I really got my start in public policy from a grassroots activist perspective. And while decades ago we used to wonder how the uh, collapse of the corporate agribusiness machine would be brought about, <laughs> I've got to say, that is not the question. The question is, what are we going to eat when that happens? Mm -hmm. Because it is going to happen, and it is going to happen in our lifetime. And um, so it's incredibly important that we be building sustainable food systems, and sustainable both in human terms and in environmental terms. Uh, a little bit about my background and the perspective I come at this with. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I, I do have a background in law and doing housing rights and tenants' rights law in Oakland. And so, you know, having a perspective on land battles uh, from a tenants' rights perspective also informs my beliefs about what needs to be done and what's important to fight for. And prior to that, uh, I attended Stanford Law School where I had the uh, great honor to have Michelle Alexander as my professor, uh, author of The New Jim Crow and got very involved in the prisoner rights movement and uh, worked at an organization called Prisoner Legal Services where it was my job to go to jail every day and, but they let me out at the end of the day and uh, to work with the inmates on uh, fighting for their rights. And so when we look about the need to restore our relationship with the land and the need to restore our relationship with people who have been treated as cast-offs, uh, I think that there's a lot of intertwined philosophy in terms of what it is we're up against, in terms of uh, a corporate system that encourages incarcerating people uh, so that someone else can profit from it, and a corporate system that encourages uh, acts that are either destructive of land or keep it away from people's use uh, in order to profit from it. And a lot of that same ideology of not really being connected to community or caring about people uh, is part of what needs to be undone in, in both of those systems. And so, you know, when we live in one of the most blessed places on the face of the earth, uh, as was mentioned, we, we live in the Mediterranean climate. 1% of the land mass on earth is the Mediterranean climate. But early human civilizations all emerged in that 1% of the land mass on earth because the Mediterranean climate, which has rain in its season, which has you know the, the, the temperature that allows for growing enough food to support a human civilization. That's where cities started. That's where humans working together in significant numbers started. And we live in part of that uh, incredible opportunity. 
And so we could be growing almost all of our own food right here. And so, and not every city could say that. I mean, some cities don't have the weather uh, to support year-round food growing. Other cities, you know, the way the land has been configured or is used doesn't allow for that. We have both the weather, the land, and the people who have the interest and the dedication and the, the concern about this that we could be achieving more of that here, uh, both in Oakland specifically and in the East Bay region uh, more broadly than almost any other part of this country. And so part of why I have been fighting so hard, and it's hard to believe it took three and a half years, um, to allow uh, urban agriculture and community gardens without a $2,500 conditional use permit in the city of Oakland is because, you know, there's a drought going on out there. You know, we live in one of the places where there still is rainfall. Are we going to let a drought of political will stop us from growing our vegetables while the rest of the state can't grow them because they don't have rain? I mean, it would, be, it would be stupid for us to die in large numbers 10 years from now because we didn't construct our own food systems when we can so much more easily here than almost anywhere else. So it, it's perfect timing to be here now because like two weeks ago we won this huge victory uh, that's been a long time coming, which is uh, fighting to change the rules for urban ag uh, in Oakland. And you know, we had to do like, even though I'm an elected official, we had to practically do a sit-in at the planning commission because uh, they kept saying, "Well, we'll get to that subject next year, and we'll get to it next year, and we'll get to it next year." And you know, fruit trees need about four years to root down to the water table, so we can't wait too much longer to start preparing our uh, sustainable food future. So we that. That victory was won this very month. Um, perfect timing. Yes. Thank you. Uh, perfect timing with the the seasons, as this is this is the season of Genesis and of planting and of the rains returning. Uh, and so let us let us grow here, and um, and really, uh, I, I'm very excited about the the aquaponics too. And talking to other folks, we're starting more greenhouses. Uh, because there's there's quite a lot uh, that can be achieved. Um, also, I want to say something about the, the orchards and how important that could be for our economy and for the broader ecosystem. You know, the almond trees in the in the Central Valley are dying out, and they planted almond trees and other trees of that kind in areas where they don't naturally grow. And the ecosystem where we live is the ecosystem where that type of tree does naturally grow. And uh, you know, we can be the, the almond supply uh, for the region, the state, who knows, maybe beyond. Uh, and so it's really also an opportunity to create local living economies. And so um, since I, I see the, the time is winding down, I want to tie this back to economic justice because Oakland has a higher unemployment rate than most of the areas around us. Um, there are a lot of people who, you know, we're trying to help people come back out of prison and not be continually sent back and need to have real economic opportunities. And, you know, we're not even gathering the fruits and nuts dropping in the backyards of Oakland. I mean, we, we live our lives as if there's so much poverty here and there's wealth we're not even harnessing. There's 2,000 acres of government-owned land just within the boundaries of the city of Oakland that's practically not being used at all. That could be being used. And we could organize, and I know some nonprofits are already doing some of this, but we could have gleaner programs yeah. that were really large and employed a lot of people and collect the fruits and the nuts from the backyard trees that aren't being collected, as well as the new ones we're going to plant in the parks and the public land. Um, and then pair that with, you know, create a canning center and a processing center because, you know, one month you're going to have too many plums. And so, you know, we'll make plum sauce and plum jam and then we'll be able to sell it and you probably could call it like Oakland Jams, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people in the Bay Area pay a lot of money for a good local jam, you know, you can support the economy of a lot of people uh, making living wages by this, and then tie it back into one of my recent victories that I just want to mention in closing, which is, uh, there's a nonprofit in Oakland called Civic Corps, uh, used to be called the East Bay Conservation Corps, and when we talk about the connection between food issues and incarceration issues, one of the things that people usually talk about in Oakland as like an unsolvable problem is what happens to the young people who dropped out of high school or had a run in with the law and now they can't get jobs and they can't finish school. And this particular nonprofit, Civic Corps, uh, hires these young people and while giving them paid employment, doing important jobs, 
also does high school completion and has a spectacular success rate. And I just fought for and won for the city of Oakland to give them the bid to run the program that's going to collect food waste and transform it into green energy through a digester in partnership with East Bay Mud. Um, and so it's going to be jobs and high school completion and employing the formerly incarcerated and reducing methane by not having the food go to the landfill where it makes methane and producing green energy and reducing our East Bay mud bills Woo! and employing Woo! local people in well, one project. So, uh,
quickly, yes, the aquaponics farms that we've designed are modular and movable. Um, we've just designed a system that builds the skeleton of the farm using wooden pallets, which are abundant, salvaged, um, potentially free, um, and, and something that with just about you know a couple days of work could move an entire farm to another site. Um, the thing about barriers, I mean, one that's coming to mind is that a lot of the city-owned properties have a lot of back taxes on them um, that run with the land. And, you know, we've been trying to figure out a way to get allies in city government that can help us navigate that system because I know that others do. I mean, large developers and people who are building affordable housing and things like that are often able to get city-owned properties at way below market rate and have all of those back taxes removed. And I think that's something that really needs to be happening for um, mm -hmm. urban agriculture businesses that are supporting and have an economic justice focus that aren't just, you know, having folks come in like they do in Detroit with Hans Farms and navigate their um, relationships with city officials that then give them hundreds of properties at below market rate but aren't employing local people and aren't that don't have an economic justice focus. Hello, Rana or Max, did you have any comments you wanted to add to? Oh, uh, I'll just say yes, absolutely. There is a history of staff negotiating case by case basis to waive past t taxes on a property in exchange for the new people coming in doing something that the city wanted. And it's happened with affordable housing projects, so there's no reason we shouldn't uh, do it with, with uh, <coughs> an ad that has tied to a, a local economic justice project. Okay, great. Rana, you wanted to make a Sure, I just want to give a little context to the, how hard it really is to get access to these, these vacant lots. You see them all over Oakland, it should not be that hard, okay? I have a kombucha business, we are operating in 1,500 square feet, and we'd like a 10,000 square feet, that'd be nice. And it shouldn't be that hard, I mean, you drive down international, blank, blank, blank. They all want a million dollars. They want a million dollars and they don't even have bathrooms. They don't have water. You want to even be safe to park your car in these buildings. They are thinking that they can hold out for a million dollars. They are thinking that, that Apple is going to come along and build a big <laughs> office here. And they're going to wait for that. And they are paying 5000 or less dollars in taxes a year. And that is the root cause. I don't know where along the line, you know, this that we the tax system moves such that, you know, we, we, off, we reward yeah. vacancy and we tax work. Yeah. You build something, you get taxed. You work an hour, you get taxed. And people who don't work, who do less, as less as little as they can, they reap the benefits. The landlord can up my rent, he just up my rent $1,000. How hard is it to, okay, to this minimum wage hike that we're having in Oakland, you know, how, how hard is it to raise the minimum wage, which would cost me $1,000 a month? It's, you know, thousands of the volunteers, all this money base to, to get that passed. But a landlord can increase my cost every month, which is no, no legal, um, no legal um, needs. It's just, it's just at the whim of the landlord. So the real cause of poverty, the real cause of this land injustice is having given all this power, the unlimited power, unlimited monopoly essentially to landlords and actually rewarding them for sitting on land. And I just kind of want to point that out, that these these other things you can do, you can, there are the good measures, and they will encourage people to put the land to use. Like, they've done this in San Francisco, they have the registry, and it's like $700. $700 is nothing to somebody who owns millions and millions of dollars in land. Um, they put more than $700 into that ballot box into keeping the laws of where they are every year anyway they will gladly pay that $700. Mm -hmm. And so w what we really need to do um, is to focus, I, I feel, on, on these long range educational and policy measures so that you know there are organizations that are trying to overturn Prop 13, like Evolve Prop 13, mm -hmm. and they're not focusing on, you know, from what I see as a Georgia perspective of like divorcing the, the tax on land from the tax on property, on the built structures on top of it, but they're open to it, and they're in a they're in a place of learning. And so, you know, we, we learn together, we navigate together, we have long range plans for policy change. And there are organizations that also are trying to overturn the two thirds um, requirement to change tax laws. Um, they might not have a land justice perspective, but if we work with them 
and we, we work alongside with them, then we can start getting these ideas you know, into the policy. And it's going to take a long time, but I, I want to encourage that that kind of be the focus, because I think it's so easy to want to look at things that are immediately successful. Like, I'm going to start this business, I have a project, and I'm going to see this, this tree grow and the fruit, I'm going to pick it, I'm going to eat it, and it's going to feel good right away. Or at least within a year or two, not 20. <laughs> and um, and I just want to say from, from the experience of House Kombucha, because I, I had this idea that, you know, I could take eight cents of ingredients and sell it for $100. Wait, maybe about $2.70. <laughs> <laughs> um, the kegs of kombucha that we sell to corporate mm -hmm. to the corporate offices, we sell them for about $100. It costs $2.70 of ingredients to make. We're steeping tea and we're letting it sit for seven days and then pouring it into a keg. It's not that much labor, right? <laughs> it's not that much overhead cost. But can I pay living wages for everybody? Not really. I'm sorry, $30,000 a year is not a living wage in the Bay Area. So even if I can employ eight people in 1,000 square feet with that kind of overhead, I cannot fix poverty. And I don't think 10,000 square feet employing four people is really a solution. And it's, it's, it's a model. It's a very awesome model. And I want to see that happen. I want to see these models and see what happens with them because we're all learning here. But a solution has to address the underlying root cause of the problem. What caused poverty? It wasn't lack of technology. It wasn't lack of smart business people. It was it's, it's the, the monopolization of land enshrined in all laws. All right. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Orange. Right. So to get to, uh, if you would keep your, yeah, of course, please. So who has $25? Anyone? All right, so some of the strategies that haven't been mentioned are with $25, you can buy bolt colors, and you can cut the locks off some of these. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally have cut locks off of city lots in West Oakland. We've been growing food on them for uh, three years now, and it's just back taxes, people running around in circles. We just keep cutting locks, and if you look to Occupy the Farm, they just cut the lock off of a 20-acre parcel owned by UC Berkeley after 15 years of students trying to get it back, and now they have a two-acre farm, and they're going for 15 more. So, you know, a lot of times we can we can do the actions because it's by by necessity to feed our people. We can do the actions to take the land back. And no offense to the politicians, but the politicians could wrap around the policy around the actions that we're doing to meet our own needs. Because it's a human right whether we go by the, if we go by the laws of morality rather than the laws of the city, uh, we can do a lot more to keep our people mm -hmm. fed and keep the land healthy. So that's what I'm So we've got, uh, I think, about seven or eight more minutes if uh, someone's in the back had a question for mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, this question is for Max. Um, I know Fat Beats has done a little bit of work or talked a little bit about this um, tension between displacement and urban green zones. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to have you comment on that. Sure. Um, so just to be brief, uh, things like, uh, who's familiar with AB551? Um, so basically it's a, a, a state law that, uh, that allows um, landowners to get a tax on the break, uh, a break on their taxes by allowing for urban agriculture and for five years. Um, so it has to be passed by each city or county um, to be implemented, and um, it's not yet implemented in Oakland because it doesn't. It's not sure if it'll make sense for the landowners here after a big survey. But there's a worry about um, developing land and doing urban greening and improving communities from the outside because what that does is it drives up the value. It also brings a lot of folks from outside the community into the community. So if we could imagine, for those that are in uh, in the Bay Area looking at East or West Oakland or Bayview, where we have all this land, and then we have these policies that allow people to come in, uh, who's gonna first have the tools and the capital to come in and put a small urban farm, or create green or plant fruit trees? That's just a question, who's gonna have that? Anyone have an answer? <laughs> Young, white folks, mostly, are gonna be coming in, and then where are they gonna be selling that food to get the highest market rate value? <laughs> Yeah, but they're going to be selling it to high-end bourgeoisie restaurants, right? And so you have this new people moving in, improving the the landscape. There's uh, the city has to pay like three thousand dollars each lot each quarter to keep it clean. So now the city's saving money. Now the property taxes are going up because there's less vacant lots, there's less stuff going on the lots. But who's benefiting from that? Most of the people in Oakland are renters, not landowners. 
So the landowners are benefiting, the prices are going up with urban greening, and who's getting pushed out? The poor folks. So we really have to be careful when we're doing urban greening, we're passing these laws. Our organization said we're not going to support AB 551 unless the city puts money to do outreach into these communities to provide the capital and the tools so that these folks can be the ones growing the food in their own community and then selling it back in the community. Because if not, what we're doing is we're just benefiting people coming in and we're creating what we talked about at the beginning is this process of gentrification, which we don't have a lot of time to get into that topic. But thank you for raising that, that point. And so urban greening is not always a good thing if it's depending on who's doing it and where. So I just, uh, just had a quick question about, because um, we're not really talking about water at this point and water policy. Um, and session how, over. And how much of, uh, how much of you know, Oakland's water is you know, coming from the Sierras and how much is coming locally? Um, I'm an architect, I do houses. Um, gotten pretty good sneaking gray water systems in, but um, <laughs> it's not legal. And I'm wondering, well, I'm wondering if there's any movement um, to get away from you know flushing our toilets with purified drinking water. Gavin. Uh, yes. Ooh, that is a powerful microphone. Um, absolutely. No, it, it is insane. We are the only species that poops in our drinking water. Other species are not that stupid. And um, I, <laughs> when, uh, you know, and, and it's very interesting to learn, you know, where the staff is interpreting the regulations and what's actually on the documents. I, I think the degrees of restrictions being put on gray water are ridiculous, and it is absolutely one of the things I look forward to changing uh, immediately uh, in, in the in the hopefully coming term, because you know that there is a lack of understanding on the part of many people about the magnitude of the drought and the fact that this is not like it's not like oh there's a drought this year and then next year it'll be all better. Or you know, or it's only in one little area. I mean, this is a serious problem. This is going to be a problem for the rest of our lives, and we need gray water um, in all the publicly owned buildings. Should be doing gray water. We need to get rid of any of the red tape uh, preventing privately owned buildings uh, from doing gray water. And I actually just uh, we just got put a contract out to bid uh, to do what will probably be the biggest gray water installation in the region um, at the Coliseum is something I just was uh, pushing for and just got approval to put out to get bids uh, to take this huge facility that has, you know, flushes thousands of toilets uh, and to have a gray water system uh, for that building. Um, so that'll be one of the bigger ones around, but it, it absolutely uh, we need to make it clear that uh, folks need to be allowed uh, to put in their gray water and for that matter encouraged. Right. Okay, we've got to shift to this side of the room here. So um, one of the land use issues that's recently um, come to my mind that I've been um, thinking a lot about lately is um, the amount of land in our urban areas that are devoted to parking. Um, yeah. you know, I, I lived in San Francisco for several years. I just moved to Oakland, um, so I'm not entirely sure what's going on out in the East Bay in this regard. But um, you know, I just recently read that you know the the, the, the parklet system is like really bumped up out here in Oakland. Um, I'm thinking about. You know, times I've been in City Hall talking about trying to make streets safer, uh, you know, pedestrians getting killed, um, bicyc bicyclists getting killed. Anytime we talk about redesign uh, of our space to be like sort of people first spaces, you know, it's, it's very often uh, people coming out in droves to say, well, if you're going to take two parking spaces away but save many lives, like, I don't think it's worth it because it's my parking space. <laughs> even, though it's like, even though this is something that these people never own to begin with. Um, but there's a lot of clout. Um, there's like sort of this parking, you know, the, the, who really fight to like have this like sort of ownership over the space that they never purchased. Um, so I, I'm just curious. Like I don't, I don't really know like what the state of affairs are in Oakland very well. I'm just like want to get y'all's thoughts on on all that. I think we had 15 new parklets approved. Is that right, Rebecca? Oh yeah, no, uh, we, we've actually been making some level of decent progress on the parklets, uh, where a lot more needs to be done is on the policy around these big uh, parking uses that are barely used. So, um, you know, people need to think four-dimensionally, and the fourth dimension is time. We have, I for example, in Uptown Oakland or uh, next to the courthouse by the lake, there is a parking garage that is used all day and empty all night. 
and across the street from it is another parking garage that is used all night and empty all day because <laughs> one is the parking garage for the apartment complex and then there's the parking garage next door that's tied to the office building and literally the one that's tied to the office building is closed and locked all night you can't pay you can't pay if you want to pay you can't pay to park in it all night right and then you have the one with the apartment building that's empty all day so we have to change our building code and our tax code to unbundle parking uh, from other units like you should not when you rent an apartment parking should never be included it should be a separately billed item that you have to pay extra for um, so that we don't incentivize people to have extra parking we need to reduce the parking ratio requirements on buildings and use the 24-hour cycle you could have half as many parking spaces if you had if you didn't have single dedicated use garages that were empty half the time but had combo garages that you had to pay for that would free up like half of them
question yet is transportation and, and the question about parking triggered it for me because I'm like it's about more than parking mate it's like we're still spending about nine billion dollars a year on highway expansion across the state of California and I, I, I want to say two things I, I partly just want to encourage everybody in this room to like call up your political representative tomorrow and say when are we going to change that and where's your commitment to sustainable transport like big time seriously and when's the money going to move away from roads and into like light rail and things that move people around affordably and safely and sustainably and then I want to ask you Rebecca like what's happening on that within Oakland actually right here in the East Bay we have a lot to be very proud of and excited about which is a powerful grassroots coalition that included environmental activists and social justice activists got together to lobby for change in how Alameda County's transportation money gets spent. So Caltrans is still a disaster and Caltrans statewide is still a huge, huge problem. But here in, in the East Bay, in Alameda County, on the November ballot is a ballot measure called BB, which is the Countywide Transportation Plan. And I was part of it, but it wasn't just me. It was a, a wide group of people, you know, people from ACE and church activists and the Sierra Club and a lot of uh, people who care about climate change. And we push and won sub substantial changes in Alameda County's transportation funding allocation. So the new measure will have the highest ratio of bicycle and pedestrian funding of any county in the nation if this passes. Um, we added funding for a free bus pass for all school kids so that all school kids, you know, we don't have school buses here, so the school kids will be able to ride the buses for free, which will also build the next generation of transit ridership being the norm. Um, we dramatically increased funding for transit operations so that the buses can run more hours and to more places. And so th this was, when I say we won, I mean in the haggling over what to put in the ballot measure, right? And I was in that room in those negotiations along with a bunch of grassroots advocates. So now what, what was written out of that process is now on the ballot in 11 days as Alameda County Measure BB. And if that passes, it means at least here in, in, in Alameda County, our transportation plan will be shifted uh, dramatically in that direction. Uh, and then we'll still have to continue to yell at Caltrans because they're still living in 1952. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything we can do to help get that passed? Is there anyone you can call to encourage those? Yes, on BB.org. Yes, on BB.org. Uh, also, Bike East Bay, formerly known as the East Bay Bicycle Coalition, is running a whole outreach campaign uh, themselves in addition to things you could do individually. Uh, so, Bike East Bay, uh, Dave Campbell, uh, all of that crowd, they have a whole campaign specifically around the bicycle pedestrian uh, transit aspect uh, campaign for that and their office is in uh, Jack London Square next to the port building. Great, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna use my moderator privilege to uh, uh, say again, uh, Rebecca, excellent job on getting the uh, first step of the urban egg zoning process uh, passed at the planning commission, but uh, we do still have the need to come out in droves on November 5th whereby that's going to remove the conditional use permit requirement of 20 some odd dollars as Max and Rebecca and, and Gavin have been talking about along with expanding the ability for folks to start community gardens throughout the city of Oakland. So that still has yet to pass full city council on November 5th. So you can be part of that and make some serious land use changes here in Oakland that evening. Um, I want to actually make sure that we mention a few things that are happening here later today. So don't skip out or miss lunch. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, Breakout 7 on my sheet, which is local manufacturing from 1.30 to 2.30. There's going to be a lot of excellent uh, speakers talking about uh, local manufacturing, bringing it back to our communities, utilizing the spaces that we have for local, pro local manufacturing and job creation. And then we'll have a closing uh, this, this afternoon at 2.40 uh, with collaborative reflections and then closing marks. and the opportunity for you to really think about what happened here today and connect with folks about the next steps. So could you please give uh, our excellent panelists one more round of applause.